pleasure to introduce to you Eddie Villamoria, direct from the Halls of Learning. Uh, now, as you know, Eddie is a writer, he's a lecturer, educationalist and engineer. Uh, he was born in India and educated at Imperial College and the Universities of Sussex and Oxford. And he's a board director of the Scientific and Medical Network, which awarded him a prize for his book, very good book, The Snake and the Rope. Given his Eastern background and Western education, he has an unusual blend of experience in the fields of science and the arts, and very significantly a cross-disciplinary and universal outlook regarding his principal vocation, which is philosophy. A student of the perennial philosophy for virtually half a century, Eddie's given courses, lectured extensively in the UK and internationally in California, in the Netherlands, in India, and also in Australia. As an award-winning consultant to the petrochemical oil, gas, aerospace, transport, and construction industries, uh, he's been project manager and head of design for major innovative projects like the Channel Tunnel, various offshore installations, and the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier for the Royal Navy. He was once an enthusiastic glider pilot, and Eddie is also a pianist of concert standing, having studied at the Trinity College of Music. Now, today's talk, The Mystery Teachings and the Unity of Man, will be in three parts. Uh, the Purpose and Method of Instruction and Principal World Centres. Of great importance is an understanding of why the mysteries speak with one voice, but in many tongues. You'll then follow with a condensed exposition on man from the mystery teachings of the West and East, from the centres in Greece, Egypt, India and Persia. The modern teachings of the Emerson era, namely Transcendentalism and the New Thought Movement, will also be outlined since these ideas were fermented during the early years of the Theosophical Society and they resonate closely with the wisdom that was disseminated through the latter. And in the third part, he'll emphasize a central feature of the mystery teachings, the double nature of the mind principle, why the average man is part God and part devil. It's explained that from whatever corner of the globe these teachings emanate, their essential purpose is always to unfold the inner nature of man. The various techniques, trials and processes in the mystery schools are all directed towards that sole objective. Eddie, over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, very succinct and well-spoken introduction and welcome everyone. My very grateful thanks to all of you for attending and of course especially to Erica for facilitating the school which is in my opinion one of the very finest uh, theosophical uh, initiatives. As always, let's start with a little meditation, but of a different nature. It's all very well talking about the higher bodies and subtle bodies, but what about the physical body? It has some million billion cells, far more than the stars in the Milky Way. And of this population, 600 billion cells are dying and the same number are regenerating each day, which equals 10 million cells per second, just in case you feel like counting them. So, no matter how diverse the cells, organs and systems in our body, they act as one unity, one orchestra, organized by an intelligent master principle. So our outlook must be a balanced one. It has to take in the very basis of our earthly existence. And many of you will know that the Templeton Foundation are now awarding a prize of 20 million, I'll say it again, 20 million pounds as a sort of competition for the best 
um, teaching on the neuroscientific basis of consciousness. Their whole approach is the brain generates consciousness. So let's give 20 million to whoever comes up with the best scientific model. Okay. Have you had a good vegetarian lunch or breakfast or dinner wherever you are? You can't raise your hand and tell me. But just as we need physical food, we need esoteric food. So we are now going to eat an esoteric sandwich. I can see what you're thinking about. But just as a sandwich has two bits of bread, one on the left, one on the right, the left bread is what I'm calling the hermit, controlling the secret light of wisdom. It's the ninth major arcana, and it portrays an aged man robed in a monkish out leaning on a staff. In his right hand he carries a lamp which he partly hides within the folds of his cape and the hermit signifies the secret organizations which for countless centuries have carefully concealed the light of the ancient wisdom from the profane. And the staff represents knowledge, which is man's enduring support. The hermit shields a lamp behind his cape to emphasize the fact that the philosophic truth, the wisdom from the mystery teachings, if exposed to the fury of the ignorance, would be destroyed like the tiny flame of a lamp, unprotected from the storm. And man's bodies form a cloak through which his divine nature is faintly visible, like the flame of the partly covered lantern. So that's just the sort of piece of bread, the exoteric covering of the exoteric sandwich. What's the filling of the sandwich? What is the filling? Well, we're going to have it in three parts. We're going to talk about the overall precepts the purpose of the mysteries, their location and their unity, that is very important. Why do they speak with one voice? Then the application, the theosophical doctrine in harmony with the mystery teachings of the Egyptians, Persians and the Greeks and the vital teaching of all the mysteries and theosophy on the double nature of the man's principle, the double nature of uh, man's nature, his mind principle. So let's start with overriding precepts. What is the purpose of the mysteries? Large gains can be made occasionally on the stock exchange, but spiritual illumination cannot be attained other than in the rarest of circumstances by trying to leap abruptly to a great height across intervening stages, but instead must be won laboriously step by step upwards by a progressive purification and refinement of the lower nature towards the condition of perfection. It is therefore a great mistake to think that just reading about the mysteries or joining a spiritual organization, anyone, the theosophical, anthroposophical, any, just joining a society can render a man either virtuous, rational, or compassionate. In fact, it's quite the reverse. Working on virtue, rationality, and compassionate service can make a man spiritual so as to qualify him for the mysteries. So this is the true alchemical process. 
the baseness of the lower nature transmuted into the nobility of the higher self. Now the great Athenian Socrates maintained that the soul existed before the body and prior to its confinement in the body, it was endowed with all knowledge. Moreover, he held that when the soul entered the material form, it became confounded, but by appropriate practices and living, it was able to struggle free of its impediment and so awaken to and recover its lost knowledge. So the purpose of the mysteries universally is to unfold the inner nature of man according to certain tested principles and strict rules which when followed sensibly elevated the human consciousness to a point where it was capable of cognizing its own constitution and therefore recognize the true purpose of existence and the secret or esoteric or occult doctrines are all about how man's multifaceted and composite and complex constitution could be most quickly and completely regenerated to the point of spiritual illumination. Now the categories, the degrees of initiation into the mysteries are numerous, but generally three in number, three milestones, so to speak. They were commonly imparted in ancient temples, of course, which represented in chambers, in chambers which represented the three great centers of the human and universal bodies. The temple was sometimes constructed in the form of the human body and the candidate entered between the feet and there he received the highest degree in the point corresponding to the brain. Thus, the first degree was the material mystery and its symbol was the generative system. It raised the candidate through the various degrees of concrete thought. The second degree was given in the chamber corresponding to the heart but represented the middle power, which was the mental link. And here the candidate was initiated into the mysteries of abstract thought and lifted as high as the mind was capable of penetrating. He then passed into the third chamber, which analogous to the brain in the human body, occupied the highest position in the temple but analogous to the heart was of the greatest dignity. In the brain chamber, the heart mystery was given. And here the initiate for the first time really comprehended the meaning of those immortal words we find in the book of Proverbs. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So for this reason, the mysteries were in all countries divided into the lesser mysteries and the greater mysteries in general. For example, in Egypt, the lesser mysteries were sacred to Isis and the greater to Serapis and Osiris. In Greece, the lesser mysteries were the Eleusinian and the greater the Orphic and Dionysian. In most cases, the lesser mysteries largely comprise dramatic rites or ceremonies alongside some teaching, whereas the greater mysteries were composed of and conducted almost entirely on the grounds of study and the doctrines taught in them were later proved by personal experience in initiation. The location of these mystery centers around the world is an interesting subject and I'm not going to go into that except to point out this beautiful 
temple initiation cave. The Elephanta caves are a network of sculpted caves hewn from solid basalt rock located in Elephanta Island, about, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 miles away from the city of Bombay where I was born. The Elora Caves represent the epitome of Indian rock cut architecture. They are a complex of 34 cave structures excavated out of the vertical basalt rock northwest of the city of Aurangabad. Now, these caves were built without any mortar. The, all the construction was done by digging and sculpturing vertically downwards. There is no cement, there is no mortar. And it is of deepest significance to me, and I'm sure to all of you, that after he made his historic venture through Media and Persia into Hindustan, the legendary Pythagoras remained for several years as a pupil and initiate of the learned Brahmins of Elephanta and Elora. And in fact, the name of Pythagoras is still preserved in the records of the Brahmins as Yavancharya, the Ionian teacher. It is of equal import that Newton revered the teachings of Pythagoras and Plato. But then after returning from his travels, Pythagoras established his famous school or university as it's called at Crotona in southern Italy, and there he taught the secrets of occult mathematics, music, and astronomy, the trivium, the foundation of all arts and scientists. So it is no exaggeration to say that the wisdom of the East has seeded and fertilized the greatest science and philosophy the world over, and this is argued with great elegance and clarity by Sir Savarpali Radhakrishnan, President of India, in his book, Eastern Religions and Western Thought, which describes the leading ideas of Indian philosophy and religion, and then traces the influence of Indian mysticism on Greek thought and Christian development through Alexandrian Judaism, Christian Gnosticism, and Neoplatonism. Now let's turn to the central thrust of my talk, the unity of the mystery teachings. Why is this? Why? There are no conflicts or anomalies between the great occult traditions once the dogmatic interpretations and outer forms of expression are stripped out to reveal the bare inner meaning. The works of the great sages are utterly unique and individual, but all sages have dipped their pen into the same inkwell of universal truth and universality is a hallmark and indication of truth. So the ink, so to speak, is the one source of universal wisdom. The sages have written with the same ink, but in different handwritings, suited to the culture on climate of their time. And theosophy is these diverse expositions of Theosophia. So we are one implicate wisdom, diverse explicate expressions. So we go from unity to diversity, and that diversity expresses as duality, triplicity, and multiplicity. In the secret doctrine, we're told that the history of cosmic evolution 
is traced as a sort of abstract algebraical formula of that evolution. And the stanzas give us an abstract formula which can be applied to all evolution, <clears throat> to Earth, solar system, and to man. <clears throat> the seven terms of this abstract formula, <clears throat> excuse me, are the seven stanzas in the secret doctrine, <clears throat> spoken of in the Puranas as the seven creations, and in the Bible as the days of creation. And that the esoteric doctrine is therefore called the thread doctrine, <clears throat> since it passes through and strings together all the ancient philosophical religious systems and reconciles and explains uh, them all. So I'm saying that in science, the reductionist technique is to reduce complex things to their simplest building blocks. But that blurs an understanding of the whole system, the whole organ, the whole organism. By contrast, the concentration of complexity into simple precepts maintains the whole picture. So in this sense, it could be likened to an algebraic formula that provides a solution to any input variable within its field. I really would like to explain what I mean by an algebraic formula. It's very simple. Here is a simple formula. Distance equals speed times time. Wherever you are, it applies. If you're on Earth, whether you are on the moon or whether you are on this planet, which I'm sure you will have guessed, is Jupiter. It doesn't matter where you are, the same formula applies. So it is for this reason, for working from the universal to the particular, that occult science is in the sense, an abstract algebraic formula about creation. And the formula represents a statement of universals as the emanating source of the vast scheme of creation, which is represented by the series. Now, what do I mean by source and series? We hear a lot about the number seven in occult science. Why seven principles of man? Why are there seven planes of nature? Why seven? It's really worth understanding this. It is not arbitrary. A lot of people laugh at it and say, oh, well, it's just arbitrary, you like this number seven. It's not at all arbitrary for this reason. There are seven entities because they came from three primary entities, which in turn is the product of a basic duality evolved from a single entity, the monad. This is strictly in accordance with mathematical law, because from algebra, we know that the number of combinations of n things taken one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, and so on, is two raised to the power of n minus one. So, if we apply this formula, the number of entities born from a basic duality is two raised to the power of two minus one, three primary entities, and the number of entities evolved from different combinations of three primary entities is two raised to the power of three minus one, seven entities. These seven entities comprise three primary entities and four secondary entities. For example, 
the seven colors of the spectrum, the rainbow, are made up of the three primaries, red, blue, and green, and the four secondary colors evolved from different combinations of the three primaries, red, green, red, blue, green, blue, and red, green, blue. That's simple. Same with man. The three primary principles, spirit, soul, body, which brought man into existence, coexist in him with the four secondary principles, which arose from different combinations of these three primary principles. And in all the mystery teachings, we find these seven principles divided up in various ways, but always pointing to this central teaching. That's why Blavatsky said, offer truth, the aphorism, the hermetic wisdom as above, so below, applies to all esoteric instruction, but we must begin with the above. We must learn the formula relating to the above before we can sum up the series below. So the formula is the algebraic expression the series is the way it works out. How does this now apply to the teaching on the seven principles of man? We come now to part two, the application of the mystery teaching, the, universe, the un unity of the mystery teachings as it applies to man. Well, man is not an onion with seven skins. The seven principles does not mean seven onion skins. As an example, each one of us is one individual. We can look at it in two ways, head and body, in three ways, head, trunk and limb, and seven ways you can divide man in any number of ways in terms of these primaries. That's his constitution. Equally, we are one unified individual in our nature. But when we wake up, we display two main functions within the home, and outside our home. You can divide this in five ways, if you like, in the home, family, and blood relations, outside the home, relatives, friends, and associates. And you can divide this in seven ways. But all of these divisions are various ways. It's the expansion of the algebraic series, so to speak, that comes from the unity. So, so how does this apply to the diverse teachings on the constitution and nature of man? Now the classical Blavatsky system, here you of course have man as one unified entity, but he displays a dual constitution, the individuality, the higher self, the personality, the lower self. He also displays this triple constitution, spirit, soul, and body. And from these three primaries come the sevenfold, the three primaries, the four secondaries. Don't get caught up in all the detail, just see the principle behind it. And we can also divide the sevenfold, again into the twofold, the upper triad, the lower triad, or some people like the upper triad, the middle duad, and the lower triad or the fivefold. All of these are entirely valid ways 
of looking at the constitution of man. And I find it nothing but utterly foolish and irritating when people get dogmatic and aggressive about which system is supposed to be superior. There are people, unfortunately, whose minds only work in dichotomies. It's going to be A or B. They can't see the blending of the two. So even in classical theosophy, where there have been all sorts of foolish arguments about the etheric double and the linga sharira, whether one stands above the other or below the other, you can see how even in classical theosophy, how the division of the principles has unfolded in Madame Blavatsky's time. Depending on who she was addressing and what she was trying to teach. So again, don't get caught up in the details. Just see that whether we look at the esoteric writings and the Secret Doctrine, Volume 3, or the Mahatma Letters and Isis Unveiled, all of these are different maps that map the human territory in different ways. The map is not the territory, but the map is related to the territory. What about other great systems? There have been no end of acrimony between the Besant school and the Blavatsky school, as though the two were ever at war with each other. This is the Blavatsky classification, the traditional one. This is Besant. Now, what's the problem with that? I think it's a wonderful and simple way of expressing the same truth. And Besant, being trained in science, distinguishes between principles, the active part, and the form, the passive part, in which the principle takes root and expression. And she relates it to the Vedantic classification, which is fivefold. But all of these are different ways of mapping the same human constitution. Different maps, one human territory. In my mind, there is no dichotomy between the Besson system and the Blavatsky system. They are addressing different issues depending on how the teaching has evolved. Let's move on. According to the Egyptians and the Zarathustrians, the Zoroastrians, this here is the Blavatsky system. And you can relate it perfectly to the Egyptian system and the Zoroastrian. The unity of the mystery teachings, their unity on man's nature and constitution. And with Erica's watchful eye over all this, we can hardly fail to mention the Greek system. Whether we look at the Greek system in general, or Plato and Socrates, or Pythagoras, they're all saying the same thing in different words and putting the emphasis on different things. The vital point to note here is the arrow going up and the arrow going down. This is Plato's great teaching. I think that'll do for now. I did say I would mention the Emerson New Thought Transcendental Movement, but perhaps we can talk about that uh, during question time, other than to say that these ideas from uh, America 
fermented during the same era as the Theosophical Society and of great value as well. Let me move on to part three, the implications for man. It is so important, this, the double nature of manas, the mind principle, and this age-old problem of good and evil. From the Egyptians, we have the teaching on Osiris and Isis, the corpus hermeticum of Toth Hermes Trismegistus. Toth Hermes Trismegistus. Before the visible universe was formed, its mold was cast, and this mold was called archetype. And this archetype was in supreme mind long before the process of creation began. But then Father, the supreme mind, being light and life, fashioned a glorious universal man in its own image. Not an earthy man, not a terrestrial man, but a heavenly man dwelling in the light of God. The supreme mind loved the man it had fashioned, and the man looking into the depth smiled, for he beheld a shadow upon earth and a lightness mirrored in the waters, which shadow and lightness were a reflection of himself. And the man fell in love with his own shadow and decided to descend into it. Mother Nature, beholding the descent, wrapped herself about the man whom she loved, and the two were ever mingled. So for this reason, man is composite. Within him is the sky man, immortal and beautiful. Without is nature, mortal and destructible. Another insight into man's psychic and spiritual and physical natures comes from the symbolism attaching to the supreme god of Egypt, Osiris. As their solar deity, Osiris represents the material life-giving aspect of solar activity, the sun symbolizing the vital principle. But this vital principle, active masculine, is the exact complement to the passive principle, inactive feminine, represented under many names, notably Isis, signifying the principle of natural fertility or fecundity. So creation is the union, the dynamic interplay, the highest form of love between the active principle of God and the passive principle of nature. And yet again, we see why man is composite. From the active principle, Father, he inherits his divine spirit, his immortal part, which at death rises out of the disintegrating clay of his mortal self. And from the passive principle, nature, mother, he inherits his body, being that part of himself under control of the laws of nature. Thus, the god Osiris is blended into man and symbolizes the dual nature of man, the cosmo-spiritual and the terrestrial, or the divine and the physical human. The Persian mysteries tell a similar story. The Persian mysteries incorporated the rites of the sun god Mithras, who has both a male and female aspect. And Mithras represents, in one sense, the intelligence principle. He stands for the god of intelligence mediating in the struggle for supremacy between Ahura Mazda or Ormuzd, 
the spirit of good and Ariman, who was initially a pure spirit who then rebelled against Olmos, being envious of his power. So when Olmos created the earth, Ariman entered into its gross elements. When Olmos performed a good deed, Ariman planted a seed of evil within it. Finally, when Olmos fashioned the human race, Ariman became incarnate into the lower nature of man, such that in every human personality, there is this constant war between the spirit of good and the spirit of evil, each struggling for control. And this is precisely why the sacred books on the subject of yoga, self-mastery, invariably propound their teachings in the form of a war. The obvious examples are the epic Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita of the Mahabharat, the ancient Indians. In each case, of course, the war depicted is entirely allegorical and used as a metaphor of the battle between the good and evil propensities within each man who has not reached full enlightenment. This double nature of man, the best understanding of the dichotomy between good and evil, I think comes from the Greeks. The Bacchic and Dionysiac rites of the Greek mystery schools are based on the allegory of the god Bacchus being torn to bits by the giant titans who then scattered the dismembered body of the god far and wide. Jupiter, the father of Bacchus, beholding this crime, hurled his thunderbolt at the titans, reducing their bodies to ashes, and from the ashes of the titans which also contained a portion of the Bacchic body, which the Titans had partly devoured, the human race was created. I'll say that again. The Titans dismembered the God, scattered his body far and wide, and partly devoured the God Bacchus. From the ashes of the Titans, the human race was created and that crea uh, contained a portion of the Bacchi God that the Titans had eaten. So the mundane life of every man contains a part of the Bacchi, therefore godly life. Accordingly, the Greek mysteries taught that earthly man's composite nature comprised his lower nature, consisting of fragments of the giant titans, and his immortal nature as the sacred life of the god Bacchus. So the Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul in the state of self-knowledge, the rational soul, mindfulness, and the titanic state, the diversity of the rational soul, which by virtue of being scattered, mindlessness, loses the consciousness of its own essential oneness or unity. How did the giants accomplish the fall of the god Bacchus? By getting him to become fascinated with his own image in a mirror, signifying engrossment in the sea of illusion, Maya, which signals the downfall of man. Hence, ordinary man is capable of either a Bacchic rational existence or a Titanic irrational existence, and for the vast majority, of course, both in varying proportions. Nothing has changed these days. Before lockdown, if you went to any of the great historical sites and museums such as the Colosseum in Rome or wherever, you see hordes of these tourists totting their selfie sticks. 
wanting to look at themselves, basically. So surely human narcissistic traits are no different now than when the giant titans recognize the same trait in the god Bacchus. In addition to the teaching on the twofold composite nature of man from the Greeks, we find this clear teaching that sorrow and suffering is the consequence of immortal man, our higher part, falling narcissistically in love with our own shadow or image, meaning mistaking this mirage cast in the mirror of deception for our true selves, mistaking the body and personality for our true self, and thereby uniting our reasoning principle with our earthly desires, meaning uniting manas with karma, giving up truth and reality to dwell in appearances and illusions. Here is the most beautiful teaching on the double nature of the mind principle. Plato tells us that the psyche, the soul in general, has two aspects. When the soul functions as nous, the rational soul, she, ally, she rises to ally herself with the immortal principle, the divine part of man, in which case all is well. This is the theosophical buddhi manas. But the case is otherwise when psyche sinks to attach herself to man's unbridled desire nature in which case she, Psyche, functions as anoya, folly, or the irrational soul, the animal soul, and the extreme, in the extreme case, runs towards eventual annihilation of the physical man and personality. This is Kama Manas. And the great service of theosophy in many ways has been to highlight the central teaching on the double nature of man. In theosophy, we say manas has a dual nature. Manas can ally herself with buddhi, buddhi manas, and all is well. Or manas can attach herself to karma, the desire nature. No one is saying that karma is evil. That is total nonsense. The desires are very important. It's really what is driving those desires. Without the desire nature, you have a ship without any propulsion. So I think I've given you a little bit of the esoteric sandwich to eat. How should we cover this sandwich? What's the last piece of bread on that sandwich that encloses the filling? That was the first one, the hermit, where we pointed out the lamp, the little flame in the lamp represented the mystery teachings that had to be hidden from the fury of the mob. And man's bodies and his cloak were the various garments through which his inner nature shines. 
And the next tarot card is called the lovers. The price of free will. Here we see a youth in the middle, flanked on either side with a female figure. One of these figures wears a golden crown and is winged, and the other one is attired in a flowing robe, and on her head she wears a wreath of vine leaves. Now the maiden represents the twofold soul of man, the spiritual and the animal. The first, his guardian angel. The second, his ever-present demon. And this is the point, both love him. Both the maidens love the youth. Hence, the appellation of this card is the lovers. The youth stands at the beginning of mature life, the parting of the ways, where he must choose between virtue and vice, the eternal and the temporal. So this card reminds us of the double nature of the mind, that the price of free will or more correctly, the power of choice, the power of choice is responsibility. And this is beautifully illustrated in Plato's teaching on Nous and Anoia that I just showed and described a little earlier. So the mysteries may well be called the thread doctrine, since it passes through and strings together all the ancient philosophical religious systems and reconciles and explains them all. Thank you for listening so patiently. <laughs>